All right. How you doing? I'm doing really good. Cool. Yeah. I've been excited to talk to you. <laughs> Yay, this is amazing. Yeah. The weird world. Yeah, it is. The weird digital world. Yeah. Pretty yeah. strange. I was just talking to a neighbor who's a teacher and it's really weird for them. Yeah. Don't know what's gonna happen. I know. I've anyway. got two daughters and I don't know what's going on with the the um the next school year. So is that Milkwood Studios? The um is this your home? So I was just reading about your Yep. This is our home and studio space. It's all here. Nice. It's nice. great. I like having everything right under one roof. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, I need to is. come out there and check it out. Yeah, you really do. It yeah. is. It's cool. Yeah. Lovely space. All right. Indoors on. and out. Right now, the gardens are spectacular. I bet. That's been really cool. Do you have help? It's pretty much just me. Jane does a little bit of deadheading, but other than that, she's not a gardener. So oh. pretty much up to me. At this point, I do have a, a young neighbor who's 13 that mows our lawn now. Oh, that's good. That is good. And he's, uh, his mom is a master gardener, so we're going to break him in slowly down here, too. Yep. Get him to do that's digging. about the age to start getting, you know, some worth, work ethics and yeah. saving your money. Yep. Mm -hmm. He loves to work. He's got really good ethics, very responsible young kid. And Nice. Loves making some money now too, so yeah. it's good. Yeah. yeah, cool. Life is good. Good. Well, um, I'm going to, um, I guess, start not interviewing you, but wanting to talk more in depth with you about why I asked you to be on here. Um, All right. And good. you're the first guest host that um, that I've that I've pursued. Uh -huh. And came in a divine moment actually so <laughs> cool Good. um i was i'm just ending my first season and it's been myself and my venture on just speaking my mind and my truth and and i've been wanting to get guest hosts to um talk to and get their perspective so i'm not just having my own perspective right um, and um as an artist and as a spiritual person um you know it was like-minded to you know, consider you, you came up right away in my mind. And oh. so I was writing down my notes about season two and I was like, okay, I want to have, you know, these certain categories of topics. And then the first thing I was like, artists, and I was like, Ooh, you know, Leo Osborne and I'm editing my other podcast. And it literally said Leo, right. Oh. As I said in my mind, Leo Osborne. And I was like, yes. Wow. So it was like, it was yes. divine timing and it was everything that I knew you were going to be. It was like that confirmation that we're not alone in this, that there's a lot of other, um, there's a lot of other sources that are helping, you know, to guide us as artists and to guide us together and why we met and, you know, what's, what we're needed for right now. And I think you've been an inspiration to a lot of artists to be um, expressing the other realms you know, of illuminated right. ones of, of spiritualism and nature. And I think to me that I was just like, Oh my God, <laughs> you know, when I first yeah. saw your work, I was like, yes, you know, I get this. And I'm so, I was so refreshed to see it. So you, cool. your art to me was just like, I got excited. I got really inspired. I got to see somebody that was doing something that I understood and that was, um, that was speaking to me on a spiritual level, not just a, you know, political level or a nature level. It was, it was really mindful. Mm -hmm. So I felt like your work was very, you know, head and heart and hand. Like you were just, you are definitely, you know, in alignment. So awesome. yeah. Yeah. I'm and that's kind of, that. cool. yeah, that's why I wanted you to share with us, um, you know, about, what you're going through right now with, you know, right. With your experience here in 2020 with, um, you know, the C word or whatever we want to, yeah, <laughs> we exactly. want to address it. Um, but the challenges that, um, you know, that you've been facing right now as an artist and producing your work and distributing your work and, you know, how's it going? Yeah, it, well, it's really different. And, and I have to say too, 
turning into my 70s, I'm 72 now, that that's made a big impact and a change because I'm on the downhill slope and I don't have that many more years to live and create. And I have to think about that and about inventory and how much inventory do I want to be taking care of? Mm -hmm. And particularly now where I don't know what's going to happen with my galleries. Um, one of them that is near and dear to me is afraid that they might have to close because they don't think they're going to be able to make the rent. And so there's all that kind of impact going on. Um, it's not just myself now looking at my own life, but looking at what's going on in the world with the, what I call the COVID-9 virus. Yeah, um, what is that about? Yeah, well, you know, COVID is one of my favorite words because it's, it's uh, the species of our, our blackbirds. And oh, ravens, in particular, are such a fond subject for me. I've got one right behind yeah. me, over my shoulder. And um, so I've been calling it COVID number nine. And it brings to mind for me, uh, like the Alfred Hitchcock movie, The Birds, and the Beatles' White Album, number nine. And so it's like this combination of these weird things coming together. The, the birds and this magical number nine. And so for me, it's become COVID number nine. Mm -hmm. uh, and it makes it a little bit lighter uh, to think about for me personally. It puts a sense of intrigue on it, uh, maybe even a little bit of humor, which seems to be very important right now to keep our senses alive. So I've thought a lot about that during this time with the COVID number nine. And it's also put me into a space of um, uh, contemplation. I've been known as an environmental artist, as well as a wildlife artist, and, and all kinds of these weird titles that you end up getting placed upon you. But I, I do have a, a strong uh, connection with environmental art. I was inspirational in in um, getting a major museum show organized called Environmental Impact. And that began about, I think it was six years ago, during the Gulf oil spill. I had a piece titled Still Not Listening that I had done during the Valdez oil spill in the 80s. Oh. Uh, and I had it here in the studio, and when the Gulf oil spill happened, I called a curator friend of mine, David Wagner, who I'd known for many years, and I said, David, I think it's time to bring this piece, Still Not Listening, back out. And he agreed, and he said, I'm gonna call Bob Bateman and Kent Olberg, uh, and they had also done environmental subjects during the Valdez oil spill. And so David organized this exhibition, Environmental Impact, that toured museums around the United States for three years. It was very successful. Um, the show came back to him and he held it for two years and released it again this year. It's Environmental Impact 2. And so that is on hold. It, it did go to a couple of museums before the virus hit. So that show is on hold until further notice. And it's supposed to, in 2022, be at the Bateman Center in Victoria. So I'm really excited that the schedule can keep on track because I'm looking forward to uh, being part of that exhibition when it is in Victoria. It's, it's right in our backyard. So environmental art has really had an impact on my life. Um, people have said, are you going to do something environmentally uh, about what's going on now? And I really don't feel inclined to. Um, it's too big of a subject. It, it touches so many areas of life that I don't feel that I want to impose my thoughts upon it artistically. I'm just going to kind of run with the whole thing and see where it takes us. And part of my feelings are that 
I'm not that much interested in doing environmental work right now as much as I'm inclined to want to create works that are simply full of beauty because I think that's what the world needs right now. We need beauty. I, I have a gallery in Maine that I've been with for 35 years and his motto is beauty will redeem the world. And I have to go along with that because I don't know what else is going to do it. It's, uh, it's, it's a very distressful time. And I think beauty is something that lifts us up and out of that state of being. So I'm trying to look at things from that perspective. I'm also discouraged because I've been working five years to create a book. It was one of my lifelong desires to write and illustrate my own book. So I got that done and it was supposed to be publicly released in February. Well, the virus hit and things shut down. Um, we could not publicly release it. I'm even having difficulties getting the books printed because they're so far behind with a limited uh, crew at the print houses. So that's kind of on hold. I am slowly releasing it online and I hope as soon as I get my first order of books, which should be sometime in the next few weeks, that I want to do an online notification that's available to all of my email list and Facebook. And just try to uh, get it out there myself, at least the first few hundred copies, and then it'll just be available on Amazon. So all of that's been on hold, and that, that's been very frustrating. So I have had great frustrations uh, involving this virus, which everybody's affected by. I, I think of young artists, I think of Peregrine O'Gormley, who, dear friend, and I, I really love him and his work. And he had this great show that was set up in Bainbridge and no one could see it. It became a virtual show, which is great and all that's fine, but it's just not being visited and, and well, even though you can't touch the work, that when you're a couple feet away from it, you're in its presence and you feel the power and strength that's behind some of these sculptures. So I feel really bad for a lot of young people in that position that are kind of stuck right now. And at least I'm on my downhill run and I'm feeling a lot better about being in that position. I'm glad I'm not a young artist starting over again. So I've been thinking a lot about that. Um, as to my core connection, my spiritual connection, I like to think of nature as being my church. And um, you know, many years ago, in the, in the early 90s, I began a series of work titled Walking Prayers. They were sculpted in wood. And they, it's a long story as to how they came to be but it was really through spirit that I was guided to do that series of work. And I called them walking prayers because my walking through the woods, through the forest, through nature, that's where my spirit is renewed and rejuvenated. And so I called them walking prayers because as I would be walking through the woodlands, I'd be in this prayer mode, um, talking to all kinds of spirits and guides and people of my past, people who I knew today that I had prayerful thoughts about. So that form of meditation and contemplation really helped me to get centered. And I found allies in these walkabout adventures in the woods. And it's always been a part of my, my daily um, exercising is to wherever I've lived is to get out into the woods and walk around. We'll probably do that later today. So that's been a big part of my spiritual uh, journey. And um, that has helped me through this period of time. It's been uh, very interesting to watch how life has not changed that much for myself and my wife, Jane, because we live here on Guimas Island. It's quiet. We have a very reclusive lifestyle as it is. We work here every day. Um, it's, it's a busy life, just keeping all of my art 
inventoried and organized and communicating with people. So being here has allowed us to live a quiet, reclusive lifestyle. And that hasn't really changed all that much for us. It's not like we had a studio in town that we visited every day or that we had a business that we had to attend to. It's, um, it's, it's been pretty good. It hasn't altered us that much. The thing that has been very difficult is that we haven't been able to see our two grandkids. And that has really been uh, very difficult. Uh, we did finally get to have them a couple weekends ago. And we hope to see them this weekend too. So we're really glad that we're getting uh, that opportunity to share time with them because it's some of our most enjoyable time is being in the company of them having them here at the studio where they love to create things and they have a, a really great creative experience whenever they're here. So that's been one of the main things that's affected our lives with this virus time. Is, and the other thing is just not being able to be with people, you know, to hug people. It's our nature to be warm and embracing. And, uh, you know, this is, a condition of the planet where um, more than ever we should be hugging one another mm -hmm. but we can't we just can't do that so there's a lot of odd things going on in the air that we just have to be present with and think about how do you think that that affects us with finding the value in in you know like what you what are you really missing you're missing your family and you're missing physical touch, you know, and I think as human beings, we came here not to, to stand alone, you know, right. and I was thinking about talking to you. I just had this vision of you and me holding hands on yeah. the grass. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. And just like, you know, touching and connecting our universes. Yeah. yeah. You know, and then when you hug someone, you're heart to heart, you're, you know, you're in alignment with that person and it's causing so much separation. Um, and in a way right now, it's, it's affecting our psychological selves. Yeah. It's affecting us as like neglected children of somebody that was neglected or wasn't held enough. You know, it's causing us to maybe, you know, go within and do self work and, I, and to reflect on what is it that we're really missing and the people that we're missing and, and the hug. I went to a memorial service with a lady and nobody could hug each other yeah. you know and she's like all i want it was for her sister she's like all i want is a hug from my sister and if wow. it was normally me i would run up to her and embrace her and right. i would hold her and i would you know give her that physical love that for some reason it's really healing yes yeah it is very yeah. healing mm -hmm. and yeah i think more than anything i'm, I'm missing that yeah uh, because it, it is, you know, I'm, I'm reading a book right now and <clears throat> there was this episode of this woman that didn't really know this other woman that much, but that other lady was having some real serious issues. And the first thing that this other person did was go up and hug her because she knew that she needed to be held and just mm -hmm. known that she was protected and in the grace of someone else. So yeah, that, that's been a tough one. Yeah. But we're all under its influence so yeah and then the, maybe when we're out of this we're going to be a little bit more compassionate and a little bit more huggy and physical you know we're like yeah you know yeah. maybe we're gonna we we lost the value in community or we lost the value in um genuine you know right exactly. physical contact yeah, yeah i think it, it's it's all gonna be for the better in the long run of things mm -hmm. and uh, yeah we just have to hang in there Keep on moving forward. Keep on keeping on. Yeah. Um, I wanted to also talk a little bit about the um, some of my history and how it relates to the bond shows that happened yeah. in Skagit Valley. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been really, really fortunate, Eve, in my journey that is has been unplanned. I, I had no direction how to turn as an artist in my early years went to art school in Boston. But I was influenced by the fact that, first of all, in Boston, I had some teachers that were professional painters in the traditional Bostonian school of painting. 
and I had the museums, wonderful museums, to really get in touch with painters of the past, artists of the past. And then as a teenager, I spent a lot of time on Cape Cod, in Provincetown, Wellfleet and Truro, Orleans, where there were gallery upon galleries with long-standing artists of, of uh, note that would live there. And so I had that experience of Boston and Cape Cod. And then um, in my 20s, I moved to Midcoast, Maine. And there I got to uh, know the Wyatts, Andy and Jamie, in the shadow of Rockwell, Kent, and Robin, Indiana, who had a, a print house, Eric Hopkins, who's a dear friend, still alive and painting, Eric Green, another great artist of Maine. So I had all of that influence, um, influence of Marsden Hartley and his work when he lived in Maine. And so all of these, these places that I found myself living in, for some reason, were these amazing art colonies, I guess I could call them. And that began my, my journey into learning about fine art, really rubbing shoulders with these great artists, whether they were dead or alive, really gave me guidance and direction. And I saw the genius that was behind all of that. And that inspired me. And then I came west in 1990. And I had, prior to that, had a long standing letter communication with Philip McCracken. We had gotten to know one another through some books and other friends, mutual friends. And we wrote back and forth, I in, in Maine and Phil here on Guimas Island. So I came to visit Phil. And within six months, I was living here and loved, loved, loved being in this place of belonging, as I call it. So it was during that time, during that move, that I got to meet local artists. I met John Simon and uh, Bill Slater. They introduced me to LeVon Newell, where they were having the barn shows, and of course, Kathy Schoenberg and Michael Clue, and, and Guy Anderson was still working at that time and, and that whole group from Fishtown which just blew my mind when I learned about that I had wished I'd heard of it earlier because I would have loved to have been part of that and I still think of Alan Moe and Michael Clue as like Fishtown wharf rats you know they just they've got that beautiful spirit of uh, what Fishtown was and in our minds still it is so again, I saw the genius come through uh, of these amazing artists that were living here, working creatively, and were led along by the spirit of the land. And that really connected me in with the lifestyle that they were living, with the art that they were doing. And that's when I became involved in doing the bond shows. Uh, it was an amazing time. Um, John was living there at the barn. We all just loved the work that we all did. I love John's work in particular because he, like myself, was all over the place. He was sculpting wood and other materials. He had cast bronze, he did etching, he did painting. and He wasn't locked into one avenue. And I was so impressed by that because that was where I had found myself going, was not staying in one uh, particular phase of art, but expressing myself through many different medias. And, and even today, I, I never know what I'm going to be doing next. And to me, that's exciting. And that keeps it alive. And, and the thrill of creating is, is always new and refreshing. So for me, that's been very important. And that, as I say, is what really connected me to this group of Skagit painters and artists. Um, and again, my journey has mostly been through spirit. There's been no plan, no advisors, no agent. Um, for me, that was the best. And I look now and I think, well, maybe it would have been a lot easier if I had found an agent. But then I probably would not have been as creative as I have been. Uh, when you have an agent and you have high power galleries, they pretty much want you to do the same thing over and over. 
and that just didn't work for me. Uh, when I when I was a teenager, I worked a summer in a compass company, and I got to make screws with a, a metal lathe. And I stood in front of this metal lathe every day, doing the same damn movements, making thousands and thousands of little brass screws. And I thought, okay, I'm never going to do anything repetitive in yeah. my life. Yeah. It was good lessons. Yeah, I mean, and you learn to work with your hands and you learn machinery. I mean, and everything we do, there's value. So It did. Yeah, everything had a value for yeah. sure. And that was a big life lesson for me, definitely, mm -hmm. which was, was very cool to experience at that young age. It, it helped a lot. Um, the other thing that really inspired me during those times was, uh, was music. Um, I'm not musically inclined. I can't play a thing, so maybe a little bit on a harmonica. But um, you know, I'm just not musically inclined. I don't understand that language. But I love music. And I, I was really inspired by the poetry of music. And musicians like Robin Williamson, who, who's still a, a longtime friend who lives in Wales and uh, we're still good buddies after all these years. He even was uh, uh, one of the musicians at Woodstock that I attended. And oh, you I went to Woodstock? Remember. Yeah, I went to Woodstock. Nice. It was great. Oh, I bet. Wonderful, wonderful. A magical time. Yeah, a very magical time indeed. And Robin was and is a very magical uh, wizard of words and music. But then I, you know, I was inspired by Dylan, uh, Bob Dylan, Dylan Thomas also, Leonard Cohen, Joni Mitchell. I mean, the list goes on and on, Van Morrison. But what inspired me was that most of these people were poets before they were anything else. Leonard Cohen, I remember interviews with him as a young poet living in Montreal. And Leonard would say such things as, you know, there was this group of us who would sit in coffee houses and talk about our poetry, talk about the world. And some of the, we, we thought what we were doing was really important. And he said, maybe it was. And I love that thought because it probably was very important. Even though at the time it was just their poetic egos sort of translating what was going on. But it came to be very influential wording. And then the magic of these poets like uh, Cohen and Dylan, they also were musicians. And as much as poetry is powerful, if we think about it, most people have memorized very few poems that they can recite, unless you're exceptional in that craft. But all of us from infancy remember songs that have been sung to us. The words, we can hear one word or one tone and a whole song will be in our mind. We can recite that. Mm -hmm. So the beauty of these poets were that they linked their words with music mm -hmm. so that we remember them to mm -hmm. today. Uh, I, I think that's a very powerful thing. And it was very, very powerful for me as a young man, a young artist to hear the words of these mystical writers this is resonating with what i'm doing right uh, now and what uh, you're doing right now and sound vibration and the the melodies that are created you know through song there's a difference between how we are receiving information based off the vibration of the information whether it's color or it's sound you know, so I yeah. feel like when you're saying that it's true, you can read poetry, but unless you hear poetry or you hear it in a melody that resonates in a certain vibration with you, it's like, it's not, you're not feeling it. And I think that that's something a lot of people forget is that we are feeling humans. Like we feel, you know, right. we resonate. Do. You can, you can really influence people by your sound, yes. you know, and here you are speaking. You know, you're speaking and your sound wave is going to go into the ears, just like your art goes into the eyes. Right. You know, and so if, if your platform 
is a song right now. I mean, you're creating music. Right. Yeah. This is this Powerful. is this is art. It is. You know. Fabulous. I yeah. love that. Yeah. Yeah. Everything is a vibration, yeah. energy. You know, yep. people that I like to think some people you're really close to when you first meet them. That's because we're on the same vibration, right. <laughs> and you're just harmonious, mm -hmm. and that's a link that is magical and un right. undeniable. Yeah. yeah, I love that. And that's why I too, I like to write a poem for every piece of work that I do, whether yeah. it's a sculpture or a painting, mm -hmm. because it, it takes it into that other realm, the, the realm of words. Mm -hmm. And it gives a deeper personal meaning for me to that particular piece of creativity. And I think it does for the viewer looking at a painting and then reading a poem that I've written about that it opens up their mind to another perspective of myself as the artist and another perspective to them as the viewer. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I have found that that's been really, really cool. I wish I could put them to music. Hey, maybe, <laughs> maybe you can, you know, there's certain things that I've written lately that are poetic and yeah. I've been, I was trying to write a book and I just got writer's block and uh. then I started speaking or and doing poetry. And then what I'm doing is I'm just overlaying um, a song with my voice. Uh -huh. And when I do that, it creates a moment of like interlacing that's happening when you right. do that. So even if you are just to record yourself saying the poem and then having um, music wow. playing in that, you know, this, like this energy feels the same of what I'm saying. And then yeah. it seems to start resonating differently. So you could totally yeah. do... Poetic song. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. Poetic Definitely. song and then have the visual aspect. Right. And maybe that's a transformation that you get to offer people and, and by speaking or recording your poems. You know? Good point. Because they're beautiful. When, when we look at your art and I have that piece of paper to read it, you feel mm -hmm. you. I feel your story and then I can see it. Right. So it really exactly. does translate, but maybe cool. you should. Maybe I should. Maybe yeah. I'll investigate that yeah. possibility. Yeah. It's another thing to do in the lockdown home right? situation. Yeah, it's, just, it's all about exploring to me. Yeah. Life, mm -hmm. art is all about exploration mm -hmm. and, and just, yeah, getting every bit of juice out of it that we can. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing to, to um, have art as kind of your foundation, really. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that's the other thing. I think we're all artists. Every human being is a creative person. Um, we, no matter how, what our religious or spiritual viewpoint is, uh, creatorship is something that we all are blessed with. Mm -hmm. and it comes out in various ways. Mm -hmm. You might be, there's artistry in all types of life. Very mm -hmm. fascinating. And my advice to others, to young artists in particular, is to explore to take advice from those that have been on the road before you, but also to, to really uh, look at that advice and make sure that you're being selective as to what you choose. And you know, in some cases, people really like getting locked into one avenue. I've known some sculptors, for example, that do, do one very definitive style. Same thing's true with painters. Um, let's say realist. You, know, you can't make anything more real than what you've made it. And your attempt to do that again is only another attempt to do the same process over again. And in many cases, that works for people. Um, in other cases, like myself, I just don't like to be tied down to any one thing. So I'm always looking to explore and to, to get to ask questions. I think the big thing too is asking questions of people, uh, other artists, agents, museum people, just asking questions and finding out ways that they, with their insight and experience, can influence you and save you some time and energy in the process of what to do with my art. How do I promote it? How do I get it out there? Um, what is it that you've done? that's um, been the most successful for you selling art? I think the most successful was um, definitely working through galleries. 
And again, for me, because I'm not doing the same thing over and over, it's been difficult for me to get into some real high blue galleries. Um, I, I pretty much stumble into my gallery relationships. Um, the first one, first gallery I went to in Maine, um, it was just a fluke that they took some of the bird carvings that I was doing. <laughs> but they sold them right away and it encouraged me to do more. And then um, I worked with another gallery in Maine, the one with uh, Harbor Square Gallery that I've been with for over 35 years. And I first met the owner, Tom O'Donovan, when I was uh, making signs. And I have the wooden sign for Tom's gallery. And so that got us uh, in connection with one another. And then as my art began to develop, as I was carving wooden birds, uh, Tom showed interest in those for his gallery. And so he invited me to show some at the gallery, which began this 35 year relationship. And he's the type of gallery that is inspired himself through the work of the artist. He's a jeweler and an exceptional jeweler. And he doesn't do the same thing all the time. And the artists that he shows don't always do the same thing continually. He has a broad scope and that has helped with me uh, being shown there. Um, and then uh, a gallery formed in Charleston where I had been doing shows every year in Charleston, South Carolina, there's the Southeastern Wildlife Exposition. And I began doing that when I lived in Maine. I'd travel to Charleston, South Carolina and bring work. And I got recognized at that festival for my work because it was different and unique. And I won several awards. I won Best in Show during some of the jurying events and stuff. So I gained a reputation in Charleston through that. And then a woman I knew in Maine opened up a gallery in Charleston and invited me to start showing with her there. And she too had a broad perspective on the work that she wanted to show. And so that began a 25 year relationship and that gallery just closed this past year. Mm -hmm. And um, that was extremely successful. And again, because I wasn't doing the same thing over and over. She had a broad clientele that loved my work. And uh, it was always exciting because we never knew what was coming next. And she was able to develop her clients to appreciate that. And it took some time because people weren't used to it. They were used to you know, seeing a painter who painted the same kind of theme every time and the same technique. Mm -hmm. So it took a while to develop the fact that my work should be sought after because you just didn't know what I was going to do next. Mm -hmm. And it was always exciting for these collectors. But it took time to develop that. And so it, it took time for me then to find other galleries. And it was usually through exhibitions that I would do. Uh, I was invited or juried into the Birds and Art exhibition at the Lee Yawkey Museum in Wisconsin. Uh, that's where I met Bob Bateman and Kent Ulberg, who later we did this environmental impact show together. Mm -hmm. I met amazing artists at some of those shows uh, who would then uh, suggest galleries that they were in. Um, I would also do sculpture shows. There's a big one in Loveland, Colorado, where I met uh, another artist who worked inspired me and we became good friends and he introduced me to his gallery owner in, in uh, Breckenridge, Colorado, which fostered a relationship that I had with them for about 15 years. So it was through um, spontaneous combustion, I guess. <laughs> you know, I would meet somebody that would have a sense of what I was doing and would connect me up with a gallery that had that same sensibility. So I wasn't really going out and looking for galleries. I wasn't knocking on doors. 
Again, I didn't have an agent that was doing that for me. So I was pretty much figuring it out on my own and finding these galleries through this serendipitous journey that I was on. I love that. That's great. Yeah, I, I've learned to really love it too. Yeah. It, it took a while to figure it all out, um, to get comfortable with that. But I also knew that I was breaking new ground. I was being different. And I hoped that I would be inspiring to younger artists to realize that you don't have to paint the same irises every yes. day, do something else. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I think that has been um, appreciated over the years. I, I've been really blessed uh, to some of, some of these uh, artists that I've known over the years who have uh, just grown to amazing heights and recognition that have called me an artist artist. I think that's been one of his compliments. Absolutely. I agree with that. You're very unique, magnetic soul. I mean, you're very inspiring because you are unique, you know, and that's why I think you're so successful is because you are um, true to who you are. And then that's expressed through your art. And, right. you know, a lot of, a lot of, I think you have a, a lot to say in this life. I think yeah. you have, I think you, your soul is just, you know, poetry. So, and it's a blessing for you to be here and to distribute the work that you have because it's um, a collective community, you know, but it's, it's our culture Yes. and you're painting our culture and you're painting for the artists to inspire us to, to um, speak our culture, our personal culture, if you will, right. you know, because we can get caught up in doing subjects that are, that are liked, that buyers want to buy, that's safe you know but is it telling a story is it is it is it impacting your journey is it you know feeding you as an artist is it you know true to you and i think that's what people really need yeah you know? so thank Thanks. you for for being true to yourself and and the arts and you know and you're just a joy to be around you're like a you're like a light bulb you come in the room and you know you just you light everything up so oh, I think cool. um, I think that's why that makes sense. Why you pursuing your journey through galleries is just, you know, just a chain effect. Mm -hmm. So yeah, well, I think that's, that's so true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's, yeah, it's never never boring. That's for sure. No. <laughs> Great. No part of it is boring. It's always exciting. And yeah, I just never know what direction I'm going in. I I'm doing some paintings right now for. A show with Scott Milo and Kathy and the small paintings um, and they're all different one of them's quite realistic a couple of them are abstract I mean they're all over the friggin place I, it, <laughs> but I don't know it's just that day that was what inspired my soul was right. I, I want to be a little more abstract today I want to use some just black red and gold mm. on my palette because they're powerful colors together mm. so that you know made the painting different it, it wasn't going to be a, a goldfinch on a branch right uh, which i did the next week i did a, a goal i'm sitting here <laughs> looking out the studio at the pond i love our little pond it's called the walking prayer pond oh. and so the pond is full of bird life and i'm looking at this beautiful little goldfinch a male goldfinch and he's on the stem bending a stem of a fresh hollyhock but, oh man, that's just too beautiful. I, I can't let this day go by without drawing and painting that. Mm -hmm. And so I did, and it was a much more realistic piece. Mm -hmm. But that's where my soul was that day. Yes. And it's like you're translating your emotional state, like Leo felt this way today. Yeah. And then that's how we saw, and then Leo saw this today. And then we got to see what Leo saw, you know? So it's like, you get to go and see what Leo felt and you get to see what Leo saw Beautiful. and you know that they, you felt in both those moments, but then you're translating your experience. Yeah. You know? And so then we get to enjoy yeah. that because maybe we shared that same experience that day, you know? Right. And then exactly. it resonates. That's what the community yeah. of arts. Yeah. It resonates. There we yeah. go. Back into that harmony. That yep. Cause voice. I have a little pond and I have the little gold finches and every time they come by, I'm like, Oh, it's a message or it's, you know, it's the Christ light. It's the yellow. It's beautiful. You know, there's so much symbolism that I get when right. I see the golden finch. And yes. The meaning in the moment when I see birds is 
huge. So, you know, yeah. you understand that. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It's, oh. all, it's all beautiful. It's just it is necessary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. We're very fortunate. Yes, we are. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> well, those are the thoughts I've written down for today, Eve. That seems Thank like you. it's gone really well. Yeah, this is fun. Yeah. yeah. And I'm excited to share this. We don't know when the barn show is happening at um, the Museum of Northwest Art, correct? Right. So they, I've heard that there's a pause until we get to a new stage in this COVID-999. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, so um, I'll be making sure to share this um, with the community, you know, and let them know to maybe send a letter to whoever needs to hear it with our government to help museums open you know that we are okay with seeing art if we can monitor the traffic or you right. know i think us as a community we need to speak up for the museum for yes. the art museums and and you know see how we can participate and yeah. you know make sure that art's shared this is a time when we need to see the art we need to be right. talking and right. feeling each other so yeah i yeah. someone sent me a video of um all the plywood art down in seattle Oh, I haven't seen that. They post, you know, they uh, put plywood over a lot of windows of buildings oh. so they wouldn't vandalize and stuff. So there's a whole troop of artists that have been painting them. Oh. I'll forward you that link. Okay. It's very, very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, no, you can't stop us. We're going to create yeah. it, you know? We're going right. to get yeah. it out to you guys somehow. So you can't, exactly. you can't lock an artist up in a box. <laughs> Even no, if this is this box we're talking to, it's like, uh -huh. you know. There's no shutdown. Nope. No, it's like, yeah. it's like saying there's no retirement either. Yeah. Someone asked me years ago, what are you going to do when you retire? I said, well, there's no plan for that. No. You know, this, is, this is life. This I is, know. this is it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I, I feel grateful every day that I've been blessed to be able to keep doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Make a living at it. It's just kind of bizarre. Yeah. Well, you were meant to do it and it flows and it's beautiful. So, yeah. Right on. Exactly. Right on. Okay. So are you. So yeah. here we go. Yeah, here we're we in go. It. We're in this together. It's great. I know. Yeah. Really? I'm excited to see, you know, what comes of all of it and, you know, yeah. but supporting everybody and making sure that we can all still communicate and, and feel, you know. So. Yeah, and feel. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm giving you a virtual hug. Here's hugs. <laughs> Hugs to you, honey. I got my arms right around you. Oh, thank you. It was beautiful hey. talking to you. And beautiful hopefully I'll, you. I'll see you soon. We will see one another soon, indeed. Okay. All Thanks, right. Honey. You take Cheers. care. Bye. Bye-bye.